you're here today to see John Field. And the story today is Death of a Coal Porter, the story of the murder at Bloody Gulch. I give you John Field. Thank you, Al. <laughs> Great to see everybody here in person. Uh, we've been waiting for uh, a year and a half to give this presentation and thought uh, the only way to do this presentation is in person. So, uh, so this is great. So uh, my cousin George saw me with this bottle here and he came up and he says, have you got bourbon in that? <laughs> I said, no, George, this is actually apple juice, but uh, maybe I should have put bourbon in, I don't know. <laughs> this, book has been an amazing experience for me, a life-changing experience. Uh, to go back in history uh, 136 years and try and document an event that almost no one remembers or has any information about has been a real interesting challenge. So uh, it took about five years uh, to do the research on this book. <laughs> And without organizations like the Elgin Historical Society here and the, and the Dixon Historical Society, this book would not have been possible. So I want to pass along a big thank you to Liz and her entire staff and also to, to Marge Rose. She helped me a lot. So um, without further ado, I'd like to take you back in history to the year of 1885. The date was September 18th. The body of a 17-year-old Elgin boy was found in a shallow grave beneath a culvert on a country road south of Dixon, Illinois. The remains were those of one Frank Charles Steele, a young Bible salesman or a coal porter who had recently changed jobs and was working at the Elgin Watch Factory, and this was his first sales trip on his own, he was found brutally murdered on that site. My presentation today details the events surrounding that murder and also the reasons why I've written this book. We will get this moving. Can I, Liz, can I get this meeting being recorded off of here so I can see the... Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. I'm sure looking, looking at this audience, there's a number of people in here that remember the dates of November 22nd, 1963, the murder of President, assassination of President John F. Kennedy. I was in Abbott <laughs> Junior High School that afternoon in American history class of all things. Our instructor was about ready to begin the class and there was a knock on the door and a person came in rapidly with a note and handed it to our instructor. The instructor suddenly got tears in his eyes and he told us that President Kennedy had been assassinated and they immediately closed the school and we were said that we could go home and join our family. So I walked home in kind of a daze thinking about the events and I, I turned around the corner and came in the driveway and there was my dad's car sitting in the driveway. And I thought, this is really strange, you know, 1.30 in the afternoon. So I walked in and dad told me that the president was dead. And I looked at him, I said, boy, I'm really struggling with the concept of murder. And dad looked at me and he said, you probably have never known this, but my uncle was murdered in 1885. And I looked at him in shock. And dad went on to tell the story of uh, his father going down to Dixon to identify his younger brother's body. And he always remembered uh, grandpa would raise his arms like this uh, and said that young Frank was trying to protect himself. And he had stab wounds here here, 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 and in his forehead. And you can imagine what it was like for, for my grandfather to go down there at 20 years old and have to identify the body. So that is how I learned about, the first thing I learned about the murder. 
About 30 years later, I was doing family history and genealogy, and uh, the name Frank Field came up on our family tree. And I thought, well, I remember, you know, still remember to this to that day that uh, the dad had told me the story of his murder. And I thought, gee, I wonder if there's anything on the historical society, uh, historical society site in Dixon uh, about Frank Field. So I called up their site. And uh, this interesting story came up, Bloody Gulch Road and Early County Justice. And I thought to myself, my God, could that be about the murder? And so I started to read it and found out, yes, in fact, this was about the murder of Frank Field. We had no idea that the road in Dixon was still called Bloody Gulch Road. The story is, is really kind of stylized and has a lot of errors in it, but it, it is about the murder. And so this was the second uh, item on the uh, historical page website in Dixon. So this is a big event in the city of Dixon. So when, when I told dad about this, uh, we knew we had to make a, a field trip to Dixon. And this is my dad. My brother took this picture right at Bloody Gulch Road. And uh, we went to try and find the murder site. Well, the interesting thing is the murder site doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I'll, I'll get into what happened to it, but we looked all over and uh, couldn't find what, what matched the story. And uh, so we, uh, we decided uh, to, uh, to talk to the folks at the Historic Society and got as much information as we could, but they knew nothing about Frank Thiel either. And I was really disappointed to find that out, that the actual victim of the murder that the road was named after was totally forgotten after all these years. So I decided to read everything I could find on the Bloody Gulch murder. And lo and behold, there's all kinds of newspaper articles. There's a pamphlet written by the museum there in Dixon. And there was recently, at that time, a book uh, published with a chapter on the murder. And of all people that wrote this, the, the girl that wrote it, her great grandfather was the defending uh, attorney for the murder. And she put a really unusual uh, twist on the story and basically was, was pushing the idea that uh, the murderer was innocent. So uh, this really stuck in my craw. So I wanted to do as much as I could to try and, you know, uh, protect the, the name of Frank Thiel and really look into it to see, well, really, is there a possibility that the murderer was innocent? So I started the research project and we looked all through the records at the courthouse in Dixon. I, I got to know the folks down there at the Dixon Historical Society really well. And we went through the records in the basement there. They have the records back to 1885, but there were no transcripts of a murder trial. And we, we thought, this is really strange. All the entries were in the book about the witnesses, uh, the times they testified, but no written transcript. So I was frustrated at that point, but I became good friends with the uh, president of the Dixon Historical Society uh, by the name of Pat Gorman. And he talked to some of the local legal eagles down there in Dixon. And lo and behold, all the records from the trial, uh, including a lot of uh, original drawings and documents were in the Illinois State Archives in Springfield, locked up in the vault with all the other Abraham Lincoln pamphlets and books and, and, letter, and letters and try and get into that place. <laughs> it's, it's like getting into Fort Knox. Uh, luckily, it just so happened that Pat had invited the director of the State Archives in Springfield to come to Dixon to give a talk before this all happened. So Pat got on the phone, called the director and explained the situation to him. And he said, well, let me look and see uh, what we have and so he got back to, to Pat the next day and he said, yes, we have a file about four inches thick that's been sealed since 1911 of all the documents from the murder trial at Bloody Gulch Road. 
So we got permission to get in there. We had to go through a metal detector. I had to leave everything outside uh, with, an, with an armed guard, except for a notebook and a pencil. And we could take a camera in. And uh, so we were able to pour through all the, all the records and take photos and that's uh, Pat Gorman there. So he was a huge help in this project. So. I really had to figure out who was my great uncle, Frank Thiel. This is the only picture that exists of Frank. And uh, who, anybody here can guess what this picture, uh, what group this picture is? George, you don't count. <laughs> this, this is the Elgin National Watch Factory Dam. Yeah. And Frank Thiel was the second cornetist at the year of 17 years old. He was an expert cornetist and he moved up uh, and that is, if you notice, uh, that is the only photograph that we have of him. And if you notice, all the other guys are much older and also have a lot of facial hair. You know, look, look at <laughs> So thank God we, were in, uh, we found that picture here uh, at the Historic Society. Uh, he's, uh, at, at that, that was right before that, that picture, uh, from everything I've been able to determine was, was uh, taken in May of 1885, right before he quit. Yeah, right quick, the watch factory. So he'd be 17? 17. This is another incredible picture that I got from Liz and the folks here. Uh, that is North River Street here in Elgin, which is now Grove Avenue in 1860. And I, I just think this is an amazing picture. My great grandfather, John Thiel, the name's obviously been carried down through the family, uh, was a cobbler from Germany. And he came to Elgin in 1856. And his cobbler shop, is this gonna work? Yeah, it does not work on the screen. I think I have a pointer here. Let's see if we can get this to work. <coughs> No. His shop is right there. And they lived above the, above the shop. They had uh, eight children. And uh, he maintained this uh, shop for a number of years on North River Street. This is a uh, partial family photo of my grandfather, uh, John, again, John Jr on the left and his two sisters. Uh, they had two other sisters and all, uh, both of the boys and the four sisters all worked at the Elgin National Watch Factory. Turns out that my great grandmother was a charter member in uh, St. Mary's Catholic Church. She was one of the first members of that, of that early church in Elgin. And Frank attended the old shared grammar school here in Elgin, where he became the accomplished at playing the cornet and therefore was able to, uh, to join the Watch Factory band. In uh, 1885, when the Thiel boys were working there, uh, the Elgin National Watch Factory, as many of you know, was the largest manufacturer of watches in the world, I believe. And they employed over 2,500 workers. And Bill, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, but that was about 20% of Elgin's total population. So that was incredible at that time. <clears throat> Frank worked in the dial room where he added uh, enamel and numerals to the, to the faces of the watches. Uh, but this is really tedious work. I can imagine doing that for, for eight or 10 hours a day of doing that very fine work. And I would think that would, that would really get to you after a while, being a 17 year old boy. And he really decided at that point after working at the watch factory for about four and a half or five years, almost five years that he wanted to try something different. So 
There was also a large, another large uh, factory in Elgin at that time, the Cook Publishing House. And at that time, they were in the old woolen factory right down on the river, uh, right where the Chicago Street Bridge is. And uh, <clears throat> there were salesmen that were involved with the Cook Publishing Company that came around and were looking for salesmen to sell their, their uh, religious um, articles and books. And a gentleman approached Frank and asked him if he would like to take a job as a traveling coal porter or Bible salesman. And Frank decided to take the job, along with another good friend of his by the name of Ed Fitzsimmons. They both decided to quit the watch factory and start to sell Bibles. Uh, probably, I, I never knew what the name coal porter uh, really meant. And uh, it is a French term that was used during the 1880s, meaning a traveling Bible salesman. And uh, so once the, the boys were hired by the John Gately Company in, out of Chicago, and in 18, July of 1885, the men left the watch factory and uh, started to sell for the, uh, for the Gately Company. And this is the Gately fam uh, Family Bible from 1884, and I have it original <laughs> right here. And you can see why people wanted this. This is gold inlay. This is Moroccan leather. This is solid walnut, uh, gold leaf pages. These sold for 18 to 20 dollars in 1885 which is the equivalent of over 500 dollars in today's value this thing weighs 12 pounds can you imagine carrying these <laughs> carrying these around well they had they had a solution for that not carrying that monstrosity around and that is this this is a salesman sampler. Believe it or not, this is Frank Thiel's salesman sampler. I did not come into this possession until January, uh, actually February of this year. Uh, we have some folks here in the audience today that I'd like to introduce the core designs. Just hold your hand up, please. Uh, I am indebted to these folks for the rest of my life. Uh, they discovered just by ha happenstance one evening while they were watching a gene genealogy program uh, that they, they had this book. Kim had purchased this at the Milk Pail uh, Antique Shop many years ago. And she remembered she had this book and it had a, a personal letter stuck in it. So they went upstairs and grabbed the book and looked and found out it was, the letter was from 1885 and the name of the gentleman that sent the letter was Frank C. Thiel. What are the chances that that letter was still in this book 136 years later? So uh, as, as we would have things, uh, Kim's brother is a private investigator. <laughs> I think. So how the heck did he figure out who, who I was? He, they went online and found out, my God, this, this man was murdered. And so uh, Don is right here too. He's next to Don is the gentleman that tracked me down. So uh, to make a long story short, uh, this really uh, shocked me when I, when I answered the phone and got the message that they had documents pertaining to the murder of my great uncle in 1885 and I should give them a call. Well, needless to say, I called them, called them right back. <laughs> And, uh, and of course, then Kim uh, sent me photographs of the book with the original signature of Frank Thiel in here, and also uh, the letter, personal letter, and the letter was sent to my grandfather. This is the letter, and very prophetically and very sadly, at the top of the, uh, of the second page, it says to tell mama not to worry, I'm all right. Six weeks later, he was murdered. So at any rate, I'd like to really thank these folks again. Uh, this, is, this was an incredible find. And uh, this all came out after I wrote the book. 
if I hadn't written the book, I, I would not have these in my possession today. So uh, all they really, all they really want to do is just to get this uh, material back to the, to the family. So thanks so much for, for your generosity and all the work you guys put in. <laughs> Was that letter never sent? No, it was uh, uh, that. Yeah, I should explain that. Uh, the letter was sent, and my grandfather had that letter in his possession, and it was inside, obviously inside this book. And when when my grandfather went to Dixon uh, for the for the inquest, uh, he was given some of Frank's sales material. These were still in Frank's room uh, when he was uh, murdered. And they gave this to the innkeeper, gave this to my grandfather. And somehow it didn't get passed down through the family when they broke up the, the seal house uh, over on Lily Street. Uh, whoever did the you know, dividing up didn't realize what they had. So it was sold to a, a bookstore. So interesting how things happen. <clears throat> so Frank got to Dixon on his first sales trip and he realized, I need to go back one slide here. He realized that a lot of the uh, families who were Catholic in, uh, in the Dixon area were from Quebec, Canada or France and spoke very little English. So Frank needed to find someone who spoke both fluent English and fluent French. And he met a young itinerant farm worker by the name of Joseph Maxime Moss. He was born in St. Thomas, Quebec, Canada in 1864, which is a small farming village in Quebec. And Frank realized that this young man could help him in selling these Bibles to the Catholic families out in rural Dixon. Uh, I was able to find quite a bit of information on young Joseph Maxine Moss. Uh, his mother died uh, uh, when he was one year old in childbirth and, he, and Moss was raised by his aunt and uncle until the age of 15 and uh, that's where he learned to read and write in his native French, and he came to the U.S. Uh, looking for jobs in the new manufacturing facilities that were just opening up. He came to Chicago in 1883 and didn't find any work there, went to Indiana and uh, didn't find any work there, and uh, he finally ended up, there was a plant opening up, a plow and a plowshare plant in Dixon, Illinois, that was opening up that was looking for workers, so he headed to Dixon to try and find a job. Well, Moss got to Dixon and uh, found out that all the jobs were filled. So he's down there with no job and looking for some sort of employment. Uh, luckily, he was taken in by another uh, French family uh, by the name of, uh, the gentleman's name was Peter Brichon. Uh, and I'd like you to remember that name for later in the presentation, Peter Brichon. Moss really struggled to find any sort of work at all. Uh, he worked at a boarding house called the Huntley House. Uh, he was a farm laborer for a gentleman by the name of Charles Nodal, who very ironically ended up coming to Elgin after this whole event was over and buying a farm. Uh, he figured out, uh, he figured heavily in the, uh, in the trial uh, and some of the uh, uh, eyewitness accounts uh, on the murder, which is very ironic. He also worked, Moss worked at the Ramsey Brick Company as a bill collector. I found that, I found that really interesting. Here's a guy that doesn't speak you know, super good English, uh, but uh, they, they hired him as a bill collector, a young boy at 20 years old. Something clicked in my mind there. Um, what, what was there about Frank Field that, that they would choose him as a bill collector? <laughs> And Moss was completely, uh, he got laid off at the Ramsey Brick Company and was completely unemployed when he, when he met Frank Field. 
So the fateful afternoon of September 12th, 1885. Frank Thiel was staying in the boarding house called the Keystone House. And if you look closely, you can see the name right at the top. Uh, and there is a balcony on the second floor there. This is Main Street in Dixon, Illinois. It looks very much like Chicago Street in, in Elgin at that time. And there was a barber shop uh, owned by Mr. George Leonard across the street. And Frank would go over there every other day or so and, and get a, a trim on his hair, a haircut and, and a shave. And being a good salesman, he realized that a barber shop would be a perfect place to meet potential customers. So he spent quite a bit of time there. About uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, Frank was sitting on that balcony with the innkeeper's daughter having a pleasant conversation. And Joseph Moss walked up down on the street and beckoned Frank to come down and meet with him. Uh, George Leonard was standing across the street and he saw Frank and Moss meet in the center of the street. And about 20 minutes later, Frank came down with his hat and coat and they started to head off down the road. There was a young gentleman by the name of uh, Willie Dixon. Uh, he was actually the grandson of the founder, great grandson of the founder of the city of Dixon. And they were coming down the road in a farm wagon with a good friend of his coming into town. And Frank Thiel and Joseph Moss were headed out of town. And Joseph Moss had a really strange habit of carrying a club or a baluster under his arm, much like this, uh, almost like a military baton, like, a, like an army officer would carry. And he had this baton under his arm as they walked down the, the road out of town. And Louis Dixon looked at him, turned to his friend, and this is what he said. I wonder if he's going to kill that man. How prophetic is that? So they, because he made the statement, they watched Moss and Thiel walk down the road for a long time. And that, that image of that really stuck in their mind from that afternoon. Frank Thiel was not seen by anyone after the evening of September 12th, 1885, after he and Moss walked down that country road. On Saturday, September 13, when Frank did not return, innkeeper Elizabeth Brodickham found his clothes and sales materials in his room. When he was still missing, two days later, Mrs. Brodingham had a terrible dream that Frank Thiel had been murdered. Fast forward to uh, six days later, the arrest of Joseph Moss. This is an amazing photograph of the police department in Dixon, Illinois. The gentleman in the center is Marshal William Woodyett. Uh, he was a hardened, battle-hardened veteran of the Civil War. I think if I was a crook in Dixon and I saw that guy staring at me, I don't think I would want to, <laughs> want to mess with him at all. So he was a no-nonsense law officer. Also, the, uh, the very large gentleman, Constable Charles Ball, next to him was 6'5 and 300 pounds. Those are the two men that arrested Joseph Moss. This is the mystery I was telling you before, the culvert, where is the actual murder site located? Like I said, the, uh, the road uh, is completely changed around since uh, 1885 and was paved. And uh, I had a heck of a time trying to discover where the exact uh, murder site was. There was a drawing in the, in the Dixon Telegraph during the trial uh, hand, just a small hand drawn, pencil drawn line drawing that showed 
where the culvert was. Uh, there is a culvert on the far side of Bloody Gulch Road that everybody thought was the murder site and, and up, to, up to that point. That was not the murder site. Lo and behold, I looked through all kinds of records uh, all across the state of Illinois. And in 1939, uh, the, Nat the Natural History Survey and the Geological Survey started taking aerial photographs of uh, farmland in Illinois. Lo and behold, there is the culvert. So we were able to locate the exact uh, spot of the murder. And uh, that's the only photograph that exists today showing where Frank Thiel was murdered. That is Bloody Gulch. At, that, at the time of the murder, Bloody Gulch Road was really called Chicago Road because it connected with some of the other roads that headed up towards the, uh, the old Chicago Galena trails. So. <laughs> the day that the body was discovered, Moss was seen by several witnesses near the culvert uh, while Theo was missing during the first few days uh, that he was missing. Moss was seen hiding a spade near the murder site on the day he was arrested. James Penrose was a farmer uh, that would traditionally drive his cattle across that culvert every day, uh, drove his cattle across there on the 18th and they would not cross the culvert. They did this habitually uh, every day. They would not cross, they bought. So Penrose said, this is really strange. So he got down off of his horse and went down and looked underneath the culvert and here was a hand and a boot. So he had seen enough and he quickly rode into town and got, and got the uh, city marshal. When Moss was arrested by Marshal Woodyett, uh, he stopped Moss from throwing Frank Thiel's watch chain down a well. This is Frank Thiel's watch chain. Uh, the marshal from Dixon brought this back to Elgin in 1911 and gave it to my grandpa. This is the actual watch that he stole off of Frank, the actual watch chain. Moss's pocket knife was found at the murder site and the gold ring that Joseph Moss uh, would belong to his fiance by the name of uh, Maggie Smith was also found at the murder site. <coughs> Uh, this is all uh, true. This is all circumstantial evidence. But back in 1885, uh, the, the forensics and the, uh, the science that we have today just didn't exist. All Basically, all evidence was circumstantial unless you had an eyewitness at that time. This is difficult sometimes for me to read. Uh, the condition of Frank's uh, body uh, was was very brutal. He had 14 stab wounds in his head, arms, and hands. His skull was fractured in two places. Uh, the police found a three-pound rock with blood and hair on it uh, by the murder site. His throat was cut all the way to the esophagus and severed. His body was covered with uh, large bruises and a baluster broken in three places was found laying outside the culvert. This is a pretty stout walnut uh, club and break that. Uh, that's why there were bruises all over his body. John and uh, City Marshal John Powers were sent to Dixon as soon as the uh, information reached Elgin that they had found uh, Frank's body and, and my grandfather had to go to Dixon with the city marshal to, uh, to identify his younger brother's body. Not a very fun trip. He received the telegram while he was working at the watch factory, <laughs> had to take the train that afternoon to, uh, to Dixon along with the city marshal to identify his brother's body. Things were pretty uh, intense in Elgin because all of the uh, field children worked at the uh, watch factory. 
there was some real, uh, some real sense of uh, vigil vigilante justice that was uh, running through some of Frank's associates and, uh, and some of his friends. The Elgin Daily Courier on September 21st reported threats of lynching are freely made and a leader is all that is wanted. He may be found before another day. That's pretty strong language to be, to be in the newspaper, the headlines of the newspaper. That same evening, the Dixon Evening Telegraph reported, and I quote, public sentiment in Elgin has been aroused during the course of the inquest. At one point, a lynching party was established or organized in Elgin, and it was only through the stratagem of officials in Dixon that the crime was not expiated with a rope and a tree. Luckily, uh, cooler heads prevailed and none of this uh, vigilante violence uh, occurred. This is the uh, Dixon County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Lee County Sheriff's Office, and uh, very interesting. The sheriff actually lived in the front part in that small building in the back on the, on the far right-hand side is the cell block, and that's where Joseph Moss was held. Uh, there were crowds of people that, uh, that gathered when they heard about the news of how brutal the murder was, and they were jeering Moss you know, through the windows of that, of that cell block. When my grandfather got to Dixon and identified the body and, and saw the watch chain. Uh, he broke down in, in tears and became very emotional. After the inquest, he decided that he had to go see this murderer that had uh, taken the life of his brother. Surprisingly, my grandfather was able to slip past the guard the guard at the uh, cell block was being interviewed by some reporters from Dixon, and he was able to sneak in and gain access without their knowledge uh, and, and came up and confronted Moss. And this is an eyewitness account of what happened when, uh, when my grandfather uh, accosted Moss. <clears throat> at the time we entered the cell block, an older brother of the murdered man stepped in, unknown to the deputy sheriff. As soon as he beheld the murderer of his brother, he lost all control of himself and cried piteously while begging those present to allow him to wreak vengeance on the man before him. <clears throat> he screamed, why did you not think of his poor mother when you killed him? I shall never see my brother again. Moss, who was playing poker at the time with another inmate just ignored my grandfather, the man who was standing in front of him. He did not change his position, nor did he even seem to look at the man who was only a few feet distant. It was an affecting sight and our sympathies were wholly with the man and who his brother was slain. That must've been quite a scene. I can't imagine what my grandfather was going through. Because Frank Field's body had laid uh, undiscovered for six days in the culvert, and due to the advanced uh, odor of death, the railroad would not allow the marshal and my grandfather to put the coffin on, uh, on the train to go back to Elgin. They had to find a wagon, a buckboard, a horse-drawn buckboard to take uh, Frank's body back to Elgin by horse. The trip took over 10 hours. And they finally arrived at the Channing Street Cemetery vault at 3 a.m. in the morning. I uh, can't imagine waking up the section, uh, having to wake up the section at 3 a.m. in the morning and have to turn over a body after that 10 hour drive with that uh, odor in that, in that wagon. The funeral uh, of Frank Field was held at uh, Channing Street Cemetery. And uh, because all six of uh, the siblings of the Field family worked at the watch factory, over 2,000 mourners turned out 
at the funeral, one of the largest funerals ever held at Channing Street. The Elgin Daily News uh, published this headline on the 21st of September, 1885, front page laid to rest. Several thousands of people assembled at the cemetery to attend the funeral of Frank Thiel. Six pallbearers were young men of about the age of the deceased. They were in procession from the home at the of the deceased to the cemetery vault and to the grave followed by four other young men bearing floral designs sent by the watch factory. The flowers were costly and very beautiful. At the grave site in the south section of the cemetery, Reverend Father Macklin conducted a brief service. The remarks were listened to with deep attention, the silence being broken only by an occasional sob of grief. Many eyes were dimmed with tears. It was a very affecting scene. This photo uh, uh, was my dad's. Uh, this is my grandfather on the right-hand side. And this is Ed Fitzsimmons. Uh, Ed was the fellow book salesman that, uh, that accompanied Frank uh, on, on their first trip. He went uh, north to Rockford and Frank went south uh, to Dixon, and uh, they were pretty good buddies. And uh, <clears throat> Ed was also a pallbearer during the during the funeral. The people of the state of Illinois versus Joseph Moss. This is the Lee County Courthouse uh, where the trial took place. Moss was charged with first degree murder and called before district court, ju court judge William Brown. The judge asked how he pleaded to the charges against him and a reporter from the Dixon Evening Telegraph wrote, when Moss replied to the question of guilty or not guilty, he stated not guilty in a very unnatural voice. I was very lucky to find photographs of, of the principal uh, Individuals that were involved in the trial. Uh, this is uh, on the uh, left would be uh, defense attorney Solomon Bethay. He uh, defended Moss uh, uh, free of charge because Moss obviously couldn't afford uh, any defense. Uh, prosecuting, uh, prosecuting attorney was Charles E. Morrison, and the judge was William A. Brown, uh, district uh, court judge, and he was actually from Rockford. <laughs> Very interesting to note, uh, the prosecuting uh, attorney was able to delay the trial for 136 days. By that time, the blood on, on all the clothes and all the weapons and thing uh, uh, turned uh, very dark and very dry. And in those days, there weren't the forensic tests to determine human blood. This was a critical, critical, um, problem for the uh, for the prosecution that they were able to get the, the trial uh, venue of stay of, uh, uh, of the date of the trial. And two days before the trial in January of 1886, uh, the area was blanketed with 14 inches of snow and the temperature dropped to 28 below zero. They had two coal stoves in that uh, in that courthouse. And there were so many people that wanted to get into that courthouse that they uh, actually had ladders put up to the, the windows on the second story and waited in line for two hours to get in to hear the uh, trial. Jury selection took five days and 95 pers prospective jurors. The trial was covered by newspapers across the Midwest, including the Chicago Tribune. A total of 80 witnesses were called to testify over the 10 days of the proceedings. Joseph Moss seemed to have trouble telling the truth during the trial. 
He admitted under oath that he had lied to police about owning Fields' watch chain. He admitted under oath that he had lied about having a spade the day he was arrested and that he took it without permission from his uh, boarding house, where, the Spiller house where he lived. He admitted under oath that he had lied about losing Maggie Smith's ring at the Spiller house, which was found at the murder site. He told witness Martin Strasser, who Frank knew uh, uh, fairly well, that Thiel is a cousin of mine and he is making lots of money. He was in debt to many people in Dixon and claimed he had a family to feed. Well, obviously he didn't. He, uh, Maggie Smith was his fiance. After only one evening of deliberation, the jury returned the next morning with the following verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty in manner and in form as charged in the indictment and for his imprisonment for his natural life in the state penitentiary. Only took him one evening of deliberation. There was talk of hanging him. Uh, nine of the 12 jurors wanted to hang him on the spot, uh, but the uh, four of the jurors convinced him that uh, life in prison at Joliet Penitentiary was enough punishment. On the evening before Moss was taken by train to the state penitentiary at Joliet, he was interviewed by a reporter from the Dixon Evening Telegraph. Near the conclusion of the interview, the reporter asked Moss a very pointed question. Is it true that you confessed to Peter Bashan? remember Peter Bashan, his friend, his French speaking friend from earlier, that you murdered Frank Thiel? Moss replied, he did not know that it was any of the reporter's business. The interviewer noted that Moss permitted himself to get into a considerable state of passion in response to that question. I've often thought about this, uh, why Peter Brashan was not asked to or subpoenaed to testify in the trial. He spoke very little English. Uh, so, so poor that uh, the uh, prosecuting attorneys, I, I think, uh, just decided it was just not worth the effort that uh, it was going to be such a such a problem getting him to admit anything and the, the jury would not be able to understand him so for some reason he was not called this is the infamous joliet uh, penitentiary for men joseph moss was put in iron shackles and taken by train at 3 20 a.m on february 1st 1886 to joliet penitentiary he remained there for 26 years, despite the efforts of a Catholic priest, local Catholic priest who defended Moss and made several attempts to gain a pardon for him. This is another amazing photograph. This is the inside of Joliet Penitentiary for men. This is the shoe shop where Frank Thiel worked for many years, or where Joseph Moss worked for many years. And uh, this picture was taken in 1895 when Joseph Moss was incarcerated there and working in that facility. In 1911, an incident occurred that changed Joseph Moss's life forever. On the morning of April 8th, 1911, while working in the prison shoe shop, Joseph Moss and another inmate stopped a third inmate from cutting the throat of Assistant Deputy Warden Captain M.J. Kane. In an ironic twist of fate, Moss received a commuted sentence for preventing the very crime that he was committed, uh, convicted of 26 years before. That is just, to me, is just incredible. This is the only photograph that we have of Joseph Moss. This was taken in 1911, the day that he was released from Joliet Penitentiary on Christmas Day. He received what was called a commuted sentence. It wasn't a pardon. He was still a convicted murderer, a convicted felon, uh, but the, uh, the governor of Illinois decided to commute his sentence and they released him from prison. Joseph Moss was never seen again.
Uh, finally, in conclusion, uh, epilogue, Moss would never admit that he killed Frank Neal. After all this, uh, he continued to, uh, to uh, claim that he was innocent. Moss is in debt to Frank Thiel for $500 in today's value. Moss is to be married a week after the murder and did not have the money for a marriage license. My grandfather was convinced to his dying day that Moss was guilty because he never once looked me directly in the eye. This is the uh, grave of Frank. Uh, he's now at uh, Bluff City Cemetery, and uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. Where did you get the picture of uh, Frank Moss? Uh, Joseph Moss? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was uh, in the Dixon uh, Telegraph, and uh, I got that from uh, my friend uh, Pat Gorman, and he had it computer enhanced. It's, it's a, all they have is a photocopy of that picture. And he had a friend down there that computer hands it for me so that we could use it in the book. But that's, that's the only picture of uh, Joseph Moss. And uh, Pat Gorman and I have spent hours and hours trying to see what, whatever it became of, of uh, Joseph Moss. Uh, Pat was able to locate a genealogy site on Ancestry.com that has some of uh, Joseph Moss's family on it. And he contacted them by email. And as soon as they saw the name of Pat Gorman Dixon, they took the site off the internet. Uh, we did find Moss, we think, in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts in uh, 1941. He was living in a boarding house, and the name of the lady that ran the boarding house was uh, the same last name of his godparents from Canada. So we're almost positive that that was him living by himself uh, in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts uh, in 1941, and, but no records at all on, uh, on ancestry or uh, on any of the grave sites uh, of, a, of a Joseph Moss being buried anywhere. So we have been unsuccessful in finding him. I, I've driven by Lily Gulch Road. And I always wondered, why did they call it Lily yeah. Gulch Road? What a terrible name for a road. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. But uh, how far is it? I can't remember how far it is from Dixon, downtown Dixon, where they live. All the way out there. I mean, I know it's quite a bit different. You know, yeah, I've, I've, yeah, Dixon, I've, I've driven it and I've actually walked it because they walk that. Yeah. It's only about it's it's only about uh, two and a half miles. Okay, so it's not yeah. as far as it. No, goes. no, okay. no. But that's still far to drag somebody out to go kill them. Yeah, you know? but but uh, the thinking is that he uh, he took uh, Frank out there and said that he knew a farmer out in that rural area that mm -hmm. wanted to buy a Bible. Some witnesses saw them arguing uh, at the train station, Frank and Moss, before they headed out there. And it looked like Frank didn't want to go. But he convinced, uh, or uh, and Moss convinced him to go. And they walked out, and that was the last thing they saw. So you think he just did it just to rob him, maybe? Or? That's the, that's the question. And I talk about that at the end of the book, uh, my, my theories. Uh, and I got some real interest from some of the people in Dixon that originally thought that, obviously, after I wrote this book, now they don't think that uh, Joseph Moss was innocent. And nobody took the time to look at all the evidence, you know, for all these years. And it, it became uh, modern revisionist history in Dixon that, all oh, you know, Joseph Moss was railroaded by the police. And I just, I just couldn't stand that. Yeah. You know? it, I just owed that to, to Frank to to try and uh, set the record straight. So, uh, and the reason, I, and I, I couldn't touch on everything here in an hour, but uh, the reason that they called that bloody gulch is that when his throat was slit, blood sprayed all over the walls of that culvert. And people came out for days in, in buggies to go down and look at that site. And there was a, there was a bloody, there were two bloody handprints on the rocks right over where the body lay. 
And of course, if they had had the technology, then they could have done a handprint and, and you know. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of good ghost stories. Too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's even a band in Dixon called Bloody Ghosts. Oh, yeah. they, they have written songs about the murder of Frank uh -huh. Thiel. And I've, I've met with the leader of the band and he, he said he, he said he hoped I didn't feel, you know, uh, that, that they were making fun of it. They've, they've actually taken it really seriously. But, uh, but that's why it's still called Bloody Ghost to this day. So, so the 1911, yeah. that's when he's, he's sentenced to Right. And that's when the file went to the state archives? Yeah. By the county? Uh, the, the parole process, uh, all that information had to be sent to the governor's office. And so the governor's staff went over all that information and uh, presented it to him. And the governor still commuted this, this sentence. So. And then, but then the file. Then the file. Then the file was was stored, was sealed and stored, uh, you know, in the uh, in the archives. Uh, so they have that record. Uh, any anybody that was that was paroled or, or went up for parole, that information had to all be sent to Springfield, uh, and then it was kept as as evidence for the the parole or the commuted sentence uh, by the by the state of Illinois. Yeah. That's yeah. And that's why people in this have Yeah, yeah, it was all gone and, and that and that is sat that file was sealed when when I, when we when we contacted the director, he said, "Oh no, the file's sealed. We haven't looked at it. Never never been looked at since 1911." So, yeah. Do you know who the governor was? Yeah, Denine. Governor Governor Denine. And Governor Deneen was famous for uh, for not uh, liking capital punishment uh, or for uh, uh, really keeping people incarcerated uh, for any length of time. He was a big parolee, uh, parolee person. We have a connection with Deneen. Ah. The Illinois National Guard, I don't think. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Wing Park. Yeah. Exactly. I've seen that. I've seen that. So, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Moss evidently owed uh, four or five hundred dollars. In, in today's value, yeah, it would have been about eighteen dollars back then. And of course, he, he didn't have, even have enough money to, to buy his own yeah. wedding license. So. I'm, I'm trying to grasp what did he do with the money if he yeah. had nothing to buy a marriage license. Yeah. And, and see, he he owed Frank that money for that Bible. Uh, I, I, another, Bible. yeah, for the Bible. He uh, Moss purchased one of the Bibles, and uh, I talk about this in the book. Joseph Moss had to give that Bible to his landlord to pay his room and board. So he still owed the equivalent of five hundred dollars, and yet he had to give that. He was going to give that Bible to his fiance as a wedding gift. So it was strictly uh, what I think is that they got into a violent struggle, you know, out there. Uh, Moss wanted uh, Frank to expunge that that loan. It'd be interesting to know what his fiance did. <clears throat> since they didn't get married, what her life was like since they didn't get married. I did find out some uh, two years later, she had a nervous breakdown. Oh, wow. They, the court had to appoint a guardian to take care of her. And uh, uh, Pat Gorman found that in the Dixon Telegraph. And, wow. and we were just shocked, not shocked, but we, it, it just, everything just fell into place that she, she completely lost all control. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I didn't think she'd be like, phew, I dodged that bullet. Yeah. <laughs> there's actually a quotation, there's actually a quotation in the Chicago Tribune, a Chicago Tribune reporter uh, went down and, and interviewed her, and she said that she never, uh, never claimed to to really agree to marry uh, Joseph Moss in the first place, and she had stopped going to visit him in jail. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what the what the Tribune reported. So, yeah. It's in so many of the customers were French speaking. What language were the Bibles, or could you choose what language? Mm -hmm. You could get them in German. In English and in French. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because I've seen, I've seen this Bible in German. So. Don, do you have a question? Yeah, how close did you come to actually locating the spot where the culprit is at? 
Yeah, we know exactly. In fact, uh, I was just talking to my cousin, Vic, they were down there uh, last year to, to look at the site and there actually is still a small culvert there. You can actually still see the contour of the land there where that culvert is. And uh, believe it or not, there is no marker there uh, at all. I, I tried to get a state historical marker there and they said that the story was not wide enough distributed across the, the entire state of Illinois for them to fund it. We, we did get permission to put a marker there uh, by the uh, county commissioner. So I have the permission. And I think what we're gonna do now is raise a few bucks for a brass plaque and, and follow through and have that spot marked. It needs to be marked. It needs to be marked. So that's, uh, that's my, <laughs> like I need another project. That's, uh, <laughs> but it, it needs to be done. And I think, and uh, that's what I'm gonna be working on. I think I've got enough uh, friends down there. I know all the folks at the Historic Society down there, and, and um, I'm sure that they would support it if uh, they, they're really strapped for funds just like everybody is. And, and, uh, but I, uh, if I've got to pay for it, I'll pay for it. So, yeah. <coughs> yes? John, a uh, question from Zoom. The documents that you looked at in Springfield, do you know if they archive those online? Are those available to look at? Uh, no. Uh, the, the Dixon, or actually it's a Lee County uh, Historical and Genealogical Society, photographed all of them. So we, uh, they have a file down there in Dixon, uh, a photographic file of every one of those that four inches thick of all those, I don't know how many pages there were in there, mm -hmm. but it was uh, direct testimony from the district attorney and, uh, and the, uh, they, the district attorney and, and his secretaries actually recreated uh, the uh, transcripts of the, of the trial and uh, because they weren't recorded by a, a, a court reporter. Mm -hmm. the, the court reporter uh, at the at Lee County uh, Historical or Lee County uh, Courthouse died before the trial and the guy that they rehired didn't know uh, shorthand. So he couldn't record the trial. Yeah. I, but, but there is a record at the Lee County there is a record, yeah, yeah, and, and, that and, and I and I actually have copies. I do have all that stuff. Uh, I, I I took we took photocopies and we took photographs. So I have I have uh, photocopies. Can it be put online? Can it be you know, put online? Yeah, I you know. Yeah, it's not. No, it's it's. <laughs> no, we weren't. Uh, yeah, we weren't restricted uh, by any uh, any copyright uh, by by the state. So, yeah, okay. yeah no. So we were given uh, free access as long as everything, all the originals, all went back neatly back into the into the file and was resealed, and it's still in the archives. So. But I do have, uh, I think, I have almost everything. The most interesting thing that I think, besides the transcript that was in that file was the actual hand-drawn map showing the murder route that, that Thiel and Moss took that afternoon. And that actual hand-drawn map that was used during the trial was in the file. And that was amazing. So I do, that's in the book. I have a photo of that, you know, in my book, so. Well, maybe we can download the, the, the yeah. harvest yeah. represented. Yeah, yeah, right? you know, if, if anybody's interested, I, you know, I just didn't know how much people would be interested in all that, uh, all that documentation, but I, I, I do have it. So the question in the back here. Do you have copies of the book here? I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> are they for uh, sale? Yeah. <laughs> we are. Uh, I, I donated uh, uh, several copies to the, to the museum here, and I guess they're all gone. So uh, okay. luckily I, I brought the, uh, I brought a bunch of copies and I would be happy to, if anybody would want a copy, they're $20. Uh, it's, it's, well, yeah. It is, it's not the biggest book in the world, but it is hard bound. And there's 45 photographs in here and some of them are color. So it, it costs an arm and a leg to, to get this uh, hard bound, but, uh, but it is, uh, uh, it is actually a fairly nice uh, book, uh, keepsake and for the hardcover. Um, should... 
Marge, do you have a question? I was just going to say that John did portray uh, his great grandfather at one of the uh, cemetery walks as um, John Fields. And um, previous to that, he also portrayed um, one more, Lyman Webster, yeah. one of his uh, Civil War. On the other side of the family, my mom's side. So our, our family, uh, my mom's side got here to Elgin in 1847, my dad's side in 1853. <laughs> so we've been around a while <laughs> in Elgin. So, uh, and uh, this is the, it's amazing what you can do with computers. Uh, I had that uh, re, uh, re-enhanced and enlarged, but that's, uh, that's great Uncle Frank. Yeah, there is there is, yeah, I uh, in fact, there's a there's a program, the computer program that, that's available on uh, some of the genealogy sites, where you can, where they will actually take two different period photographs and compare the likeness. And I compared uh, this photograph with the 18th photograph of my grandfather, and they said you can usually you can come up with 30 or 40, maybe 50 percent likeness. It came out 66 percent. So. That's not. Pardon me? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, just, yeah it's just amazing. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, he's in that tape over there. And John, I'm sure we'll answer questions as long as we want to ask it. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm here until tomorrow. <laughs> so thanks to everybody. Uh, really uh, appreciate everybody taking the time to, to hear the, uh, the story. So thank you for coming.